first way they start is the uh, thresholds. Uh, for in, order, in order for you to sense anything, you have to have a minimum amount of stimulation. And uh, they've done research, uh, what was his name? Gustav Fechner and uh, Ernst Weber. I think it was Ernst Weber. Yeah, they did the uh, research on absolute uh, thresholds and uh, the threshold it takes to notice the difference between the two. I wanna make sure I got the guy's name right. It is Ernst Weber. Okay, Ernst Weber. All right, cool. So, absolute threshold. These are two simple concepts. And uh, difference threshold. Uh, these are both, again, Gustav Beckner. Weather. These are pretty uh, simple, I think. Absolute th threshold is just the uh, minimum amount of any stimuli or stimulus that you would need to even detect it at all. So for sound, the amplitude, the, the minimum amplitude for us to hear anything is, is uh, if it's a zero, we can't hear it. But as soon as it's above zero, uh, we're able to hear it. All right, so uh, that's uh, the absolute threshold for hearing. And then, of course, I think I told you guys, this isn't an absolute threshold, but after 85 decibels, prolonged uh, exposure can damage your hearing in the long term. But uh, you need to be above a zero to even hear it, otherwise you won't hear anything at all. All right, uh, so for sound, for example, this would be uh, anything above zero decibels, uh, you can uh, hear. Uh, does anybody remember what it was for light when you uh, saw in the notes like a month ago? Yeah, five photons or, or, or like rays of light basically uh, are required for you to notice it at all. Otherwise to you it's just pitch black. If it's three or four uh, photons, to you it's, it's just black. Uh, but after that you can actually detect there being some light as opposed to zero. It's really hard to get zero light. Uh, there's always some form of light coming in. Uh, you could completely darken your room, but odds are there's some rays getting in from outside uh, unless you've like totally sealed your room off. So you can do it, uh, it's just, difficult to do unless you have zero windows uh, and your door is completely sealed. Like even those little lights coming in through the cracks at the bottom, uh, zero light would mean you wouldn't even know where that door was. You wouldn't even know if you're close to a wall or not unless you could feel it or hear the sound coming off like right next to you. Uh, that's what it would take. Um, so yeah, uh, five photons of light. Uh, difference threshold is somewhat consistent for humans, but uh, it's not exactly consistent because again, as you age, your vision and uh, hearing become worse. Uh, so you noticing a difference in volume or a difference in light intensity uh, might vary individually. Uh, but that's essentially what this is. is this, the difference threshold is the minimum amount uh, required to notice a difference in uh, volume or amplitude, I guess. Volume or... Uh, uh, brightness. So if I increase the amount of light or I increase the amount of sound, this is the minimum amount it would require for you to notice. Oh, uh, you made it louder. Oh, you made it quieter. Oh, it's now dimmer. Oh, it's now brighter. Uh, that's the difference threshold. So I could actually add tiny little bits, whether they're light photons or a, a slight raise in amplitude, and you wouldn't notice that it was actually increased. There is a minimum amount required for you to notice, okay, that's louder, or, okay, that's quieter. Uh, it's really hard to do that because it's such a tiny amount, but it, it is possible. Uh, anyone ever heard that expression? I can't exactly how, remember how it goes, but like it's like uh, the boiling, like if I were to put you in a, in a thing of water and uh, you're in there and I just slowly increase the temperature like 0 0.001 degrees like every second, how long would it take you to notice that the, uh, water had actually gotten much warmer? A long time or a short time? It would take a long time, right? Because you, you don't even notice those little increases and by the time it's amounted to enough to even detect, your body's adjusted to this new level. So it would take a long time. There's some, there's some saying that I forget how to, to phrase it about like uh, the frog boiling in the pot uh, because if you just put them in there and then you slowly increase the heat, they won't even notice they're boiling until it's, uh, they're already you know, boiling essentially. Uh, are dead. So that, that's, that's kind of what that means. If you go slow enough, people can't really detect it easily. Um, that's a difference threshold. Okay, and then what was the other term attached to this? Was it signal detection? Yeah, signal detection. Uh, 
This one is uh, your ability to essentially like pick up a sound or whatever stimulus based on your experience. So um, if I gave you a bunch of like, uh, hmm, what could I, how could I, if I just like a, did a generic jungle sound, right? It's a bunch of like bugs and you hear like a monkey and you, you know what I'm talking about, like if you're trying to go to sleep or something like that, you can look up sounds of sometimes like jungle music or rainforest music. Uh, not well, music, but sounds. Um, would you be able to detect the specific sound of uh, that a dung beetle makes? Would you be able to? No. No, I wouldn't either. Why not? I don't know what it sounds like. Right. So signal detection is it's kind of two things. Number one, it's your ability to, to pick up a, a specific a stimuli out of a bunch. Uh, so like we would all recognize the sound of the monkey like you you play that music and then uh, you hear like a monkey sound like we'd all recognize that we wouldn't know the dung beetle though would a person who is an expert on dung beetles be able to recognize that sound they would right they can hear this mess of uh, stimuli and they can pick out the one uh, that they that they're able to distinguish uh, and it's based on experience too so I'd have to hear like using the monkey as the example I'd have to hear the, the sound of a monkey in my life and recognize that's what a monkey sounds like for me to even have a chance at noticing uh, when this music's being played, which sound is the monkey. All right, I could probably distinguish the sound, but I wouldn't know what it was necessarily. All right, so there's a bit of experience needed because you have to be able to expect and know what it sounds like, but it's your ability to hear like a bunch of different things and pick out uh, a specific sound. All right, does that make any sense? Okay. Um, did the sub ever play a video for you guys about passing basketballs around? Yeah. Okay, they did that one? Good. Um, that one is actually a little bit different. That one's more about uh, selective attention and intentional blindness, which we'll get to. Uh, but that could be a similar thing because you can pick up like the, the bear in that example. If you were expecting it, you'd be able to see the bear, right? Like the second time you watch it, you're like, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, but if you're not anticipating it or you don't have any experience with it, uh, you wouldn't notice it. Like if you had a toddler and they didn't know what a bear was somehow, uh, they wouldn't notice it at all because to them it's just a bunch of things moving around. Uh, so you, it's a mix of picking out the stimuli amongst many uh, and having some experience to be able to identify it. So it's both. You gotta understand how it's both. Because right, I was like, yeah, you can just, you can identify them. I was like, yeah, well, you have, to, you have to know what the sound is to be able to identify it. All right, so uh, identifying single stimuli out of many, or stimulus rather, out of many stimuli. All right, stimuli is plural, stimulus is singular. I might accidentally say the wrong one when I'm speaking, but that's, that's what that means. Okay, um, so while I've got, while we're talking about attention, let's go to uh, attention before we talk about processing. Um, the, uh, I love that video, it's a great one. I'm glad he showed it to you. Uh, I wasn't sure if he was gonna do that or not, but he did. Uh, so that one's an example of inattentional blindness. So not only do we need a, a specific amount just to, to detect it and to notice the difference and some experience to uh, pull signals out, but we actually have the ability uh, to focus on a specific one if we want. So first we'll talk about, before I get to the inattentional part, uh, the cocktail effect. Cocktail effect. Or more, probably more uh, well known as uh, selective attention. What's selective attention? What you got? It's like when you focus on one thing above like a, a, a mixture of other things. Yeah, among many, right. So if we were all, well, this happens like when we have a break. When we have a break, there's multiple people talking, correct? Are you able to hear the one person you're trying to hear? And, and unless they're so quiet, you can't, I guess. But assuming that they're speaking at a reasonable volume, you can drown out the other sounds and then listen only to the person you're focused on, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's selective attention. I'm getting a whole bunch, but I can kind of pick the one I'm focusing on. Now, there are some things that will you know, prevent you from that. Like people who have ADD, by the way, not ADHD, ADD. Um, there's some uh, form, I don't know how what the error is in their brain with perception, but it's really hard for them to focus on uh, one stimuli. So if there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, sounds coming in, they'll hear them all kind of like the same volume and it's really hard for them to, to focus on just the one. Um, so that, that might put it into perspective. So if you ever say, oh yeah, I have ADD, it's like, eh, you probably don't. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can focus in on one thing. Uh, we'll talk about that later uh, in the year. 
By the way, ADHD is totally different. That's where uh, you lack stimulation, so your body is constantly seeking stimulation, uh, whatever it might be. So people that have ADHD are fidgety, um, like they'll always move th around. They might have, they might always be like kicking their leg or doing something or tapping the, tapping the table, and they get up constantly and uh, they they move from thing to thing very quickly. That's that's what ADHD is, and that might hurt your focus because you can't just sit down and do one thing, especially if it's boring. You get bored really quickly, and your body starts trying to stimulate itself, and you, you do other things. Uh, ADD though is like I actually can't pay attention, uh, no matter what. ADHD though, if I. I should just include this in there because it's part of perception anyway. ADHD is different though. Uh, if I have something I like, I will lock in on it and I'll stick on it. So like uh, if a person has ADHD, they're gonna really struggle to do things that are kind of boring or monotonous. They'll get bored easily and then their brain will wander off and they'll look for more exciting things, even if they don't try to. However, if they like it, they're sucked in. They're, if they're being stimulated, you, you can't get them off. They get like hyper-focused on that one thing. So that's how people can like play video games for 12 straight hours and you forget to go to the bathroom and eat and stuff like that. Like, that actually happens. So usually when big games come out, like, you have a few deaths because people forget to eat or drink water or go to the bathroom and stuff. I know you're all like, what? Like, look it up, man. It's it's a real thing. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that they all have ADHD, but I would say they're, it's highly likely because that's how you can get locked in on one thing and, and get off of it. Not get off of it. Okay, uh, that's selective attention. Uh, but if I am focusing my conscious attention and processing on one thing, uh, it makes it really easy not to notice the other things because I'm doing it on purpose. Now, if, if a threat's coming in, and we'll talk about this in a second, if like I'm talking to you and then there's this like a, a baseball coming at me, it's been hit from a field or whatever, uh, my brain will pick that up and it'll realize it's a threat because it's coming in quickly. And even if I'm not paying attention to it, it'll divert my attention that way and I'll, I'll go to miss it. But if it's not a threat, if it's just kind of a non-threatening thing in the background, uh, the odds of me not noticing it are pretty high, just like you guys saw in that video. Uh, it was, I think would you'd like watch how many passes the, the white team had or something, right? Something like that. And you're like really paying attention uh, trying to count how many passes there are and you even notice that in the background there's like this bear in a, in a black suit that comes up and does like the moonwalk or something like that uh, and the first time you don't even notice I, I remember the first time I did it I didn't notice the bear but I do remember specifically when I was watching it I noticed there was some weird movement in the center uh, I did not notice there was a bear by any means when I watched it the second time I was like oh my gosh well there's a, there's a, he like walks out stands there and does the moonwalk uh, but uh, if it's non-threatening, you, you don't really detect it, or you're much less likely to detect it. All right, so that's, uh, that's by basically how almost all magic tricks work. Uh, it's, it's sleight of hand in this direction. So they'll do things that make you look and focus where they don't want you to so that they can like slide things in and out or, or, or do whatever it is that they're doing to, to, uh, to, to fool you. Sorry, it's not real magic. Uh, they're just making you focus on something uh, so that they can do something without you noticing, if that makes sense. Uh, and that's uh, inattentional blindness, which I didn't write up here. So again, so long as the uh, stimu uh, stimuli coming in are non-threatening, uh, I can lock in on one, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm much less likely to notice changes uh, in what goes on in the environment, um, which is also like change blindness. That is... Uh, when, for example, let's say I come home every day and I don't usually take a good look as to all of the decorations and pictures and arrangements, uh, and if my wife changed something, the odds that I would notice that are probably pretty low unless it was a big thing. Because uh, when I come in, um, I don't really pay, I don't focus my attention on all the details and arrangements, so unless it's a big thing, uh, I'm probably not going to notice it. So if she like switches a picture out or something, uh, I might notice if she moves something big like the couch or whatever. Uh, but yeah, if she changes a subtle detail, I'm not going to notice it at all. Um, and I, did he show you the example for this one or no? For change blindness? It's different than the, the passing the ball thing. This is like when uh, they, uh, you have a YouTube video and then like, you know how people like on these videos, they'll be talking and then they'll cut to a scene, they'll cut back to them talking. You know what I'm talking about? So they'll be like, oh, blah, 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 this thing, and then they show a clip of something, or, or, or they show a different clip of them talking. Um, that would be like, they're doing their, their video like this, uh, and then they cut to a scene, and they cut back, and it's the same person in the same setting, but like one little thing's changed in the background. Like, maybe they changed their shirt, 
uh, or you know, uh, one of the pictures in the background has changed or it's not there, or there was a globe there before, but now it's not there. Uh, the likelihood you notice that is pretty low if you're focused on you know, the actual message of the video. Uh, so they do that sometimes to trick you, uh, and that's what Easter eggs are for the most part. No, actually Easter eggs in, um, in movies are more inattentional blindness, but um, that's essentially it. It's like a change in the environment that you don't notice because you don't pay attention to it. Your attention is consciously focused elsewhere, and if it's a minor detail, you're not gonna, you're not gonna perceive it or pick it up. A big one you will though, or a threatening one you probably will. You guys got that? So what's the difference between inattentional blindness and change blindness then? Um, change blindness has more to do with like the environment and like the things around you and inattentional blindness is more like you're just not paying attention to something if you're like focused on one thing. Yeah, exactly. That one's less focused on the environment and more focused on just all the stimuli coming in. So I can, even though all these stimuli are coming in, I can pick one and uh, kind of uh, block out the rest uh, and focus on the one. Uh, change blindness is again like an environmental change that you do, do or don't notice. So like if I change the words on the uh, on that that uh, shelf back there, uh, and you didn't notice, that would be an example of change blindness. All right, and that's probably pretty common. If I were to change them, I don't think any of you would notice because you don't really look over there. It's not really that important. Uh, but if I got a new projector or I changed the board, you'd probably notice because that's one that you often have your focus on. Or like I changed the desks, obviously you'd notice that one. But subtle changes in the environment, uh, there's a good chance you don't notice them. All right, um, I know I have something else in that category. Oh yeah, you're all experiencing this right now, sensory adaptation. Actually, you're also experiencing intentional blindness because there's actually tiny little sounds and, and sources of light coming in. And when, you're, when I'm talking, you're, you're focusing on me. Or when you ignore me and you start looking at your phone, that's also uh, an intentional blindness because you're drowning me out and then looking at your phone or whatever. Sensory adaptation. That one's a, this one's a cool one. Uh, this one I feel bad for my wife for because she, uh, she probably has ADD or at least is on the spectrum for it because she has terrible sensory adaptation. So if something's uh, loud or repetitive uh, or cold or hot or whatever, she, it, it will constantly bother her. Whereas uh, me, thankfully, uh, I can drown stuff out super, super quickly. So selective, or sorry, sensory adaptation is when you're constantly getting the same stimuli, uh, your body sort of takes your attention away uh, from that stimuli. So for example, uh, when I'm walking around each day, assuming that they're mildly comfortable, do I feel my clothes on me? No. Nope. But think about it. now, do you feel your clothes on you? Yes. You do, yeah. So it's the same thing all day, and as long as it's not like uncomfortable, um, like for example, right now, this part of my neck is starting to get uncomfortable. There's like a little thread or something in there, I think, that's like scratching my neck. I notice that, but the rest of it I pretty much don't notice. Um, and that's sensory adaptation. So that happens when you uh, uh, jump in the pool initially, uh, assuming it's hot outside and the pool is cooler, it's gonna be like really cold. But what happens after a few seconds? Or a few minutes anyway. Yeah, you get used to it, right? And it, and it, it that sensory adaptation, it stops uh, alerting you to something that's not changing that you already know. Um, so yeah, the best example I give though is the clothes. Um, temperature wise, uh, I know that the pool is a temperature example, but some of you are probably too hot or too cold in here, but some of you are probably uh, just right. But can you feel the temperature right now? If you think about it, can you feel it? Like, you, can you be like, all right, it's warm or it's cold or it's yes. just, yes. you can, right? But were you noticing it before I talked about it? No. No, unless you're like shivering or sweating, uh, it's not gonna really uh, jump to your attention. Your body just kind of drowns it out because it's just the same stimulus over and over and over and over and over. Um, this is why I was so happy I have this uh, and my wife uh, hates it. If there's annoying noises that are constant, my brain just drowns them out like immediately. And thank God, because I used to work at Cold Stone when I was uh, about your age actually. <laughs> And uh, they repeated the same like five songs over and over and over. And I would have gone crazy if I couldn't just block it out. And then people always complain about They're like, oh my gosh, it's the same damn song. I'm like, oh yeah, I haven't noticed. Like it just, it just goes right out. Um, and my, my brain just goes, yeah, 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 I already know. And, it's, and it takes attention away from that. Uh, we also lived uh, by a railroad tracks, like two blocks away from some when I was growing up. And my parents, uh, I don't know, I got lucky, I guess, because both my parents were super annoyed by the trains always going by. Like they'd blow their damn horn, they'd be like, why do they blow the horn so much? Like, 
and they do blow the horn a lot, but like, I never hear any damn horns because I'm so used to hearing it and my brain just blocks it out. And I would think that one of my parents would have that too because I got my genes from them, but I guess there was some new combination that they gave me. But regardless, I was super happy about that. Um, and I gotta add another one to this. They just uh, put up a, uh, uh, a veterinary hospital by our house uh, currently. And uh, there's a bunch of dogs and they're always barking. And my wife just hears the barking all the time. And like, after day one, I don't hear any barking. Um, our dog will bark constantly. Like, why are you, oh yeah, she's barking at the other dogs. But like, I don't hear it, thank goodness. Uh, my uh, sensory adaptation kicks in super quick for whatever reason. So I appreciate that. Thanks, random genes. But anyways, any questions about sensory adaptation? It's just, again, a non-threatening, non-extreme, uh, constant stimulus or stimuli, uh, and your, your, your brain just doesn't focus on it. But when you do focus on it, like your clothes, all of a sudden you feel your clothes. You're like, oh, I feel my socks and my pants and my shirt all of a sudden, or my glasses or, or whatever it might be. All right, any questions about that? Sweet. And then let's go to processing. Processing, so yeah. Um, I think here might be a more clear example for you on bottom up and top down processing. So if you actually wanna change this on your notes or whatever, that would be great. But again, this is a hard one for a, uh, for a substitute to come in and explain, unless they already know the concept. So uh, bottom up is of course based on just the uh, sensory information processing. Uh, and top down is based on your expectation or experience with it. So here's what I'm talking about. Um, so purely sensory info, input, uh, and top down is, you do have to obviously see or hear it, but you have a certain understanding or experience or expectation with that uh, stimulus or stimuli. So that is a process, perception, uh, considering experience or expectation. All right. Um, this, by the way, top down is when, uh, that's why you don't notice sometimes your own spelling errors, because you just read over it, because you, you sort of expect what the next word is going to be, uh, and you might even have the wrong word or, or it's missing, but your brain fills it in. Uh, that's kind of what this is. That's more of a context effect, but uh, let's see if this helps you out. So, you guys know what that is, right? What is it? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So if, if I'm looking at this, right, assuming I wrote it correctly, if I just base it on the sensory input, I see a one and a three, right? Yes. Can we agree on that? Yes. I, I know it looks close to a B, but is there a separation there? Yes. Yes, okay, so that is a 13. However, it's going to be really hard to see it as a 13 if I do this. Nope, it's a really hard to see anything if I do that then. I want it to black though, so it matches. Is it easy to see the 13 now? No. No, it's really difficult. What are you seeing? BBC. Yeah, you see the you see the B now instead. All right. Uh, what changed? You added the letters. Okay. The context. The context. Yeah, the context. My my expectation changed, right? So I expect it to a B, B, a B, but if um. If I look at the actual sensory, if I just focus on that, and I just focus on the lines, it's much easier to see the 13, but when I look at them together, and I apply my experience uh, and expectation, it makes it m look a lot more like a B, essentially. Um, so that, that can, man, that can be applied to so many things. Like I told you guys about the, the, the wood pile, you know, you can see that differently, depending on your experience and knowledge of it. Uh, but this is, a, this is a probably the most clear-cut example of if I just look at the sensory info, it's a 13. But when I put it in this context, uh, and my expectations uh, are included, that's top-down processing, where I, I, I anticipate that and perceive it as a B, even though it's actually a, a 13. It'd be different, though, if I went like this. What is it now more clearly? 13. 13, right? And it, it actually looks clearer, too. Like, it's not as easy to confuse it with a B. You could like focus in on it and, and think that it kind of looks like a B, but uh, this is 
Uh, again, me applying my expectation uh, and perception, or my expectation to the perception of those, uh, of those lumbers. So, does that make sense? Yes. yes. How about this one? Actually, this was brought up earlier today. We talked about that experiment where they uh, went out and they would find Republicans and Democrats and then to explain stuff that either Trump or Obama did and they would flip it. So like, you know, they'd start them off like, oh, to a Democrat, here's this thing that Obama did. Um, and then they, their expectation was what? That it'd be a good or a bad thing? Bad. You guys got that screwed up, actually. It's a Democrat, and I'm like, here's something Obama did. Oh, good, good. Yeah, they, their expectation is uh, it's gonna be a good thing. So they hear the information, even if it is actually sounding bad, uh, and they're either gonna defend it or think it's a good thing, right? And then they find out, oh, it was actually a Trump thing. And then the same thing in reverse uh, for Republicans. They would go up and say, oh, here's the thing that Trump did. So their expectation is, oh, it's gonna be a good thing, or oh, I have to defend it. Uh, and then they find out actually that it was, a, it was an Obama thing. So if they had just listened to what it was, uh, and thought about if it was good or bad, that would be um, more so an example of bottom-up processing, whereas top-down would be them applying their expectations. So if they think it's coming from the leader of their political party you know, in the recent past, they would expect it to be something they support, uh, not something that they would oppose. Does that make sense? All right, um, so that's bottom-up and top-down processing. Okay, and so those are covered. Now we just have uh, the perception regarding uh, gestalt principles and facial recognition. Cool, that actually is a good time for us today. I need new markers, it's not a dime. All right, uh, this is actually one of the uh, four sort of cornerstones of uh, contemporary psychology. Uh, they're evolutionary, biopsychosocial, cognitive, and gestalt. Uh, so that's one of the four. And the reason why they're separate from the other three is it is distinguishable. So biopsychosocial bio is the, the interaction of uh, uh, your genes with uh, your environment and with, with society, essentially. Uh, you basically, your mind, biology, and society all kind of interplaying, because they do affect you. Like, there's things you will do in the presence of certain people and you won't do in the presence of others, right? Like your parents, or your friends, or whatever. You can act differently in front of them. Uh, then there's also evolutionary, like the influences we have uh, from our evolutionary past, uh, whether they're motivations or their instincts or their emotional responses or their our, our network of frontal lobe development that allows us to see other perspectives and problems, all that stuff. Um, cognitive would be, of course, seeing how the brain actually works uh, mechanically uh, with the neurochemicals and the actual structure and all that. And lastly is gestalt. Because we have, and this is why it's separate, we have this weird predisposition to group things uh, and give things meaning and continuity. Uh, and, and we don't even do it on purpose. Our, our mind just automatically does that. Um, so that's what Gestalt principles are. They're one of those four uh, cornerstones of uh, contemporary psychology. Gestalt principles. All right, so um, this basically is uh, your predisposition. And again, it's really hard to not see this. Uh, to uh, uh, group things together or uh, see continuity between things, if there is any, uh, or um, oh, what's the third one? Group continuity. I'm blanking. This is what happens after you've been doing this for like 10 hours straight. If someone could look that up, that'd be wonderful. Grouping continuity and what else? That's one of the applications of it. I know I'm forgetting one. What? Oh, see, things as a whole. Thank you. Yes, that's act. That is actually different. This is grouping multiple things together. This is seeing continuity between things, and this is actually. Uh, you could, it's kind of like grouping, but you're seeing them as a whole instead of individual parts. All right, and uh, we we have a predisposition for this. Uh, this is why I could uh, I can arrange uh, and cut flowers in a certain pattern. And I can actually like see a message. I just saw one the other day from Disneyland. It was um, uh, it was it was super simple. It was like they had like the green grass part around, and then they had like white flowers on the inside. Was like uh, the flowers, like yellow flowers in like a Mickey a Mickey head shape or Mickey face, right? Um, I could just look and see a bunch of flowers, but I actually it's almost impossible for a human to look at that and not see the Mickey face. 
Like you can't just look and be like, yeah, yeah, those are flowers. Uh, it's, it's really hard for you to separate them in your head and not just see uh, the Mickey face. That's a Gestalt principle. You, you want to see things as a whole and continuous uh, or, or grouped together. So some examples are, uh, if I draw this on the board, oops. My mind automatically sees four lines, right? What are the four lines that I see? Yeah, but like why? Why didn't you look at them that way? Because you were um, grouping them by the colors. Yeah, you group them by color automatically. Even if I added this other one to make it like perfectly symmetrical as far as the number goes either way, uh, none of you are interpreting this as four lines that way. You're interpreting it as four lines uh, vertically, right? Not horizontally. Uh, and again, that's because your mind automatically groups them together. Did anybody immediately think, oh, that is 16 indiv individual dots, eight of which are white, eight of which are black? Anyone think that? No. Everyone thought there's four white lines, or sorry, two white lines and uh, two black lines, right? Even though that they're separate units and all of that, uh, we automatically group them together. Uh, and then when we don't have this grouping, it looks weird to us. It's almost like we see nothing. Like if you had to describe it, it'd be almost hard to describe. I hope I don't accidentally make a pattern here, which I might do. So you like something next to your name. What? Oh, no, I was making a joke that we like grouping things together. Yeah, that I do it automatically. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's a, there's a sign in there. I didn't like accidentally make a swastika or something, so that's nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would have been terrible. I'm like, well, we're cutting that one out. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's harder to, uh, to think about. Then you really have to consciously try to count the lines because you don't naturally see it. So when I look right at that, it just looks like a mess. And I actually try to find a pattern in it. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but did you immediately like, try to look for a pattern? Yeah, because you, you try to find some continuity or grouping. Uh, and when there isn't any, it's, it, it's hard for us. Um, it would be the same thing if I did a bunch of random dots like all over the place, like all the same color. Um, are those all just a bunch of dots randomly put on a board? Yes. Yeah. Yes, but what does my mind automatically do in at least a couple of those areas? Focus on the one that's focus on the group. Yeah, you focus on the groupings, right? Almost like they're galaxies or something in a, in a, or, or stars in a galaxy that are clumping together. Uh, we do that automatically. There's another, uh, so that's all grouping. So that's, uh, that's the grouping uh, and or seeing them as a whole, not quite so much as a whole, but uh, here's the continuity or seeing them as a whole. So if I drew three lines, or four lines, yeah, four lines. I'm gonna draw four lines. Did I randomly draw four lines? Well, I didn't randomly draw them, I guess, but are those four lines separate? Yes. They are. But what does my brain actually see? You see one continuous line. You have breaks in it, but you see one continuous line. You almost see like a serpent, right? Or, or something like that that might be swimming in the water or, or whatever. Um, there's other examples too of, uh, I can do this with any, any assortment of lines if I'm doing something like this. Okay, hold on. What do you see automatically? Yeah, you see a triangle, right? You got some differences, but none of you were like, I see three circles and six lines. No one says that. Uh, you automatically see the triangle, and then maybe you could sort of dissect and go down, but you automatically uh, group things and see them as a whole, or like the lines I gave you, you automatically see them as one continuous line, even though they are broken apart. Uh, and that is a specific predisposition that we humans have, all right? So I think I gave an example for all of them. Yeah, this was the serpent. This was the uh, uh, circles and um, uh, lines that are actually, you see it as a triangle. And then this uh, is the, uh, the dots that I showed you. You don't just see them as, in fact, it's hard to see if they are random uh, uh, dots up there. But if I put them in those four lines, you just automatically see those four lines. Okay. And um, one thing I can expand on that with is the uh, figure ground phenomena. I, I'm not going to be able to draw this very well. But there is something that sets this apart from uh, the other phenomena. Which one was it that I was going to talk about? 
Oh, perceptual set. That was the other one I was going to talk about. Yeah. So here's the difference between the two. This confuses some people. Figure, ground. I definitely cannot draw the, uh, the perceptual set one. Do you guys remember that image he showed you that looked like potentially the head of a bird or a, or a, or a yeah. rabbit? Yeah. I'll try to draw that, but I'm not going to be able to do that. Perceptual set. Because uh, this does confuse some of the students. Figure ground is, um, you are looking at one image, but it's actually two different parts of the image. And it's really hard for you to separate uh, the two, or sorry, combine the two. So if you look at one, the other one becomes the background. So the, the common example is the vases or faces one, where it's something like this. Oops. Something like that. Not the best faces, but. So the way I colored it, I, to me, the vase kind of sticks out. But uh, if I focus on those faces, which aren't really drawn that well, uh, do I still see the, um, the vase? Mm -hmm. No, it, it becomes the background, actually. You can't really focus on, once I focus on the vase, the, uh, the, the faces go all the way, to, they become the background. I don't notice the detail in them. And then when I focus on the faces, that uh, vase becomes the background. So that's the figure, uh, uh, figure ground phenomenon. If there's two things that are, on, that are 2D, but you look at uh, one of them, the other one becomes like the second plane. It becomes like the background. Uh, but I am focusing on two different parts of it. So the difference between this and a perceptual set, and this is where people get, get confused, is a perceptual set is I'm looking at the exact same image, but I can see it two different ways. All right, so here I'm actually looking at two different planes, right? So image one that I could see might be the vase, uh, and then image two might be those faces. You with me on that? So you're actually looking at two different images technically. I realize it's one, but you can perceive two different images inside of it. Um, for the, uh, and I'm not gonna be able to do this very well, something like this. Yeah, it ain't that bad. Okay. Something like that. There we go. Um, I can actually make this a picture too. This is the phenomenon where it's really hard. Well, first of all, you have a predisposition to see one for whatever reason. Uh, some of you would look at this and see a weird bird looking up at the sky. Uh, and then some of you would see a uh, bunny looking the other direction, but also kind of upward towards the sky. Can you see both at the same time? No, you can't. And usually, if this is like the first time you ever see this picture, you'll only see one of them. You won't even see the other one. Like, you'll be like, yeah, what's the picture of the bird for? And then someone tells you it's a bunny. And you're like, no, it's, oh my gosh, it's a bunny. And then, uh, then you're like, then they realize, oh my gosh, it's a bird. Uh, and you flip between the two. Uh, but I'm only looking at the same image. Like for this one, because it's figure ground, when I look at one, the other uh, fades away into the background. This one's not fading into the background. It's still a part of the same image you're looking at. So I'm only looking at this, but there's two different ways to perceive it. It's like 1A is the bird, and then 1B is the bunny. That was, that was perfect, because the bees for bunny. Uh, but I'm looking at the exact same um, image. I'm not like, nothing becomes the background. Not like anything fades in and out. I'm looking at the same thing, but, it's, but my mind can only see Either the bird, not with weird because I put this here, or the uh, bunny at the same time. All right, and again, try to recall the first time you saw it, you probably only saw one of those things, whether it was the bird or the bunny, and then it was mentioned, and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, it, it does look like both, but you can only see one at the same time. So that's the best I can, best stab I can take at differentiating between the two is figure ground, it actually becomes two different images. This one, it's the same image, you just see it differently. Uh, you're focused on the one part. Because am I focusing on the background here at all? Does the background change this image at all? No, no it doesn't, right? The becoming a bunny or a, uh, a, a bird, I don't even need the background at all. Like I could have just left it like this. And it'd be the same thing. But if I took the background of this one, it would, it would be pretty much just a base. It'd be hard to see the faces if it, if it wasn't there. Make, make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Last part then, before we go, is um, some research uh, with our... Um, visual cortex that was done uh, by Torsten Wiesel and oh, that was the other guy. 
I wrote his name down. Because I knew I'd forget. David Hubel. There we go. Uh, and I've talked about feature receptors before, but the thing I want to mention here is they're the ones that really did a lot of work on how we actually perceive things like distance or unique features. So um, I think I forgot the term actually, perceptual constancy. So perceptual constancy. And feature receptors, they both uh, are closely similar. Um, perceptual constancy allows me to uh, look at uh, any one person, like uh, I just pictured my wife, but you can picture anybody, your mom, your dad, whatever. Uh, can you tell it's them if they're facing sideways? Mm -hmm. Can you tell it's them if they're facing backwards? Yeah. You can, right? You have this ability, or upside down, right? All of these things, you can perceive them no matter how, um, uh, which way they're rotated. Do they look exactly the same from all angles? No, they don't. Uh, but your ability to be able to know that even though the information you're getting is different, like they look slightly different, they're angled differently, or they're at a different distance, it's still the same person. Uh, so I know it's a cat, whether the cat's uh, colored green or uh, a natural color, or it's facing away from me or towards me uh, or running. I I'm able to realize that that shape, that pattern uh, is a cat, uh, and I can even identify usually which cat it is. Like, that's my cat. You know, my cat's name is Lunchables. Like, that's Lunchables. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and, and you can tell uh, uh, which one it is specifically because you're able to recognize it. That also has a little bit to do with feature receptors too, not receptions, uh, feature receptors too, because that's what enables you to actually distinguish between faces, right? The reason why I can like look at you and, and I know your name uh, is because I can recognize the difference between you and the next person. Um, if I have this part, these feature receptors in my uh, 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 frontal lobe and, and, and visual cortex, if they're damaged in any way, I can no longer recognize people. I might know you and know, oh, this is something you've done. Uh, but if you show up every time, be like, hi, hello. And like, I won't know who you are, uh, basically. And then you can remind me, oh, I'm uh, your student, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember you did this thing and this thing. And then you could go walk around the corner, come back around, uh, and I wouldn't recognize your face still. Uh, I might recognize your voice, maybe. Uh, but the ability for us to distinguish unique patterns and like store those in our, in our uh, memory, uh, that's, that's largely because of our feature receptors. Uh, does anybody, by the way, know how you can tell how far away, no, how you can tell the texture of somebody? Yeah, we'll say distance, how far away you can tell they are. Obviously I could tell if, if they're going away, they get smaller, and if they come closer, they get uh, larger. Let's say they're not moving. How would I know uh, that their nose is closer to me than their cheek? Is that your depth perception? It is your depth perception, right. And I'll actually talk for, for a moment about that. So for this to even occur, it'd be possible, I have two eyes and two ears. Otherwise, I can't tell from what direction something's coming, coming or in the case of vision, I can't tell exactly how far away it is uh, to get my depth perception. All right, uh, so if I only had one ear and a line was sneaking up behind me, how would I know it was sneaking up behind me? Could I, if I had one ear? Mm. No, I might be able to hear the lion, but would I know what direction it's coming from? No. Almost certainly not. Uh, why does two ears allow me to do that? Two sets, or like two different things that can take any information. But how do they differentiate as to like, it's coming from my left or from behind me or from the front or whatever? How would I know? Because like if it's coming from your, um, if it's on like your right side, it'll, the frequency up from the right side will like trigger your I still get the frequency in my left ear. Because like if, uh, assuming it's loud enough, the sound's gonna, yeah, it'll go to my right ear, but it'll also go to the tree next to me, bounce off and come back uh, to my left ear. What's the difference though? Yes, the difference is the amplitude. So I'm gonna be getting uh, more direct um, 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 sound waves, but they're also gonna be louder too. Uh, so if somebody's approaching me from the right, I actually hear with both ears, but one ear is getting a much clearer uh, louder um, uh, message. So that's the way, I, the, how I would know, oh, it's coming from this direction because this one's uh, getting this much uh, signal and this one's getting just that much signal. So I automatically know from which way it's coming. Um, same with the uh, eyes, but a little bit differently. If I'm just looking at one thing with one eye, it's actually 2D, it's no longer 3D to me. Um, I might be able to gauge that a bit based on like lighting and shadow, uh, just like you can kind of draw a 3D picture on a 2D surface but I won't be able to accurately, uh, consistently 
place my uh, self in that 3D space. I need that second eye to give me the little differences in distance so I can gauge exactly where it is. And again, that's why you can draw things that look 3D. And if you close your eye uh, uh, in one eye, you can see and you know, oh, that's 3D, that's not 2D. Uh, but it's basically the same thing as if you were to try to touch this in a different spot uh, or, or further back or whatever, you, you wouldn't be able to consistently. Did I show you guys that when I put the pen down and I tried to touch it when I had one eye closed. Yeah, you can do it randomly, uh, but it's much harder uh, and you have to do it much more slowly. So that second bit of information from a different angle allows me to see exactly how far away it is as opposed to a 2D picture when it's, I don't know exactly. Because again, there's slightly different angles on these pupils so that I can actually tell, oh, it's actually a little bit uh, further away to the right or a little bit further away to the left. Uh, and that's the only way I'm able to actually uh, perceive it. But if it's too far away, I can't because I don't have enough information unless I can see the thing getting smaller, I know it's going away, or I can see it getting closer, I know it's getting, or it's getting bigger than I know it's uh, getting closer, essentially. So that's how those two work. Um, oh, do you guys remember what it's called if you can't recognize faces? Yeah, prosopagnosia, that's correct. So fine feature receptors damage not working for whatever reason. Uh, prosopagnosia. All right, uh, net depth perception, and uh, just know that because you, I think there was actually one year you had to some, you had to like explain why you needed two eyes or two ears or something like that. So that's why I always I always talk about that. So have a basic understanding. It's basically just to know if something's far away or not. You you gauge the distance with your two eyes because they can see slightly different distances at different angles, but also uh, uh, lighting too. Like if I make something dimmer, my brain interprets that as being further away. Uh, that's why makeup works the way it does. If people want to make their nose seem smaller or bigger, uh, they can uh, use makeup to, to uh, add lighting or add shadow. If you add shadow, it makes it look like it has more depth. Uh, and if you add lighting, it makes it look like it's a little bit more uh, of a flat surface, essentially. So that's why, like, um, I know men don't typically use makeup, but uh, women, if they want to, like, make their cheekbones seem more pronounced than they actually are, they can put some uh, darkening, like, under the cheeks here to make it look like they're cheekbones protrude a little more uh, or they do with their eyes or like I said they often do that with their nose if they want to make the nose seem like it's like maybe their nose is they think it's too small they want to make it seem longer or vice versa they can actually use shading to do that um, and if you add shading it adds depth and if you take shading away it makes it seem more shallow uh, and that's how we perceive things so perception um, there's ways you can detect things unconsciously and that can actually affect your uh, uh, perception, and that can actually affect how you view people and other things. Oh, outside I'm hearing my sound music. Okay. So anyways, um, what's the way I can actually still take in information that I'm not even aware of, actually? So if I'm focused on talking to a person, I'm still taking all this information, my brain's actually still processing it, even though I'm not aware of it. What's that one called? Yeah, dual processing, correct. So uh, the example we give is um, how if I am talking to somebody and that <clears throat> baseball stuff starts coming at me from off in the distance, even though I'm not paying attention to that baseball, uh, I'm still processing the information. So my brain, even though it's not consciously aware of it, is going to notice that and then alert my conscious attention to that. And I'm gonna take maneuvers to avoid that uh, ball coming in. But I'm doing it constantly. Like I constantly am gauging how far away you are, what your texture is, what the temperatures, all these things, but I'm not even aware of it. Uh, however, I'm still processing the information because I don't know if I've ever showed you guys this, but uh, referring to uh, processing speed and uh, power, like we use in computers, your conscious focus is only like 40-ish bits of information, uh, whereas the unconscious bits you're taking in are uh, well over a million uh, bits. So it, it's, it's a pretty drastic uh, change. So dual processing, that's what that is. Uh, taking in and processing conscious and unconscious information. So what does that have to do with the next topic, which I'll describe here in a second, subliminal messaging. What does that, what does dual processing have to do with subliminal messaging? So this is me taking in all the info, then what's the, uh, what's the application of subliminal messaging? Um, for subliminal messaging, you're like not aware that you're like reading the message that it has. Yeah. So um, like, you know, 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 like,
you're focused on something else, but you're also like unconsciously thinking in that like message. Um, okay, fair enough, but what, what impact does that have? Because that could just be dual processing, because I'm still taking information, even though I might not be aware of it. So even if it's too fast for me to recognize, like if I show you an image and I splice in little other images, and they're coming at you so fast, you can't even actually see them, your brain still does register the info. What impact does that have, though? Yeah. That impacted their view on the dude. So when they spliced the image of the gargoyle, they were like, oh, he seems like not a good person. And he's like a little creepy. And then when they spliced the image of the baby, they were like, oh, he seems like yeah, a good guy. Yeah, exactly. In fact, we'll actually, um, for the video anyway, we'll use the example that they've actually, the study they've actually done, because that one was made up, but it's the same idea. Uh, so they uh, <coughs> gave group A a picture and group B a picture. So it was randomly selected, randomly signed. It was just a guy, a smiling guy, same guy, exact picture. I know that I didn't write them exactly the same, but it's the same, same exact picture. There's group A and group B. They saw this picture, and they were asked to uh, rate uh, what their perception of this guy was, right? So if you just looked at the picture and there was nothing else going on, you'd be like, he looks like a smiling, pleasant guy in this picture. Uh, however, when the reports came in, group A overwhelmingly thought this guy looked creepy or untrustworthy. Uh, whereas Group B thought this guy looked uh, warm and happy and nice. Uh, what was the difference there between the two? Because there was something the experimenters did uh, to, to affect this. For the images, they have little spices in the middle, and for Group A, that was a group that thought he could be as a werewolf, and for the yep. other group, it was a puppy. There we go. Werewolf uh, and a puppy were spliced in. So, uh, for those of you that forget, or those on the internet, what they did was, they gave this image, but what they did was they spliced in little micro images. No, actually it's a full sized image, but they're so fast you can't actually detect it. Where a werewolf was spliced in. So they look at this guy's picture, this image, and they're actually seeing really quickly uh, images of a werewolf, like this ferocious werewolf. So even though they're not aware that they're seeing this werewolf while well, they're looking at this guy because it's coming in and out so fast, uh, their brain still perceives it. So how, how do they, what feeling do they get when they're perceiving this werewolf without knowing it? because they're unconsciously processing it still. What feeling do they get? Yeah, they get like an uneasy feeling, right. So because they look at this picture and they don't know they're actually seeing little images of a werewolf come up really, really quickly, they get this uneasy feeling. So who do they, who do they apply that uneasy feeling to? Okay. Yeah, the guy, right, which is why this guy was defined as creepy or untrustworthy. Uh, but the puppy, which most people respond warmly to or happy to see, uh, that also affected their perception. So that caused them to see the guy as what? Kind, nice. Yeah, kind, nice, trustworthy, exactly. Uh, so the feeling they got from this was like a, oh, warm, nice. Uh, and then they obviously didn't know they were looking at a puppy, an image of a puppy coming in really quickly. Uh, so they applied that feeling to this guy who made, and he seemed warm and, uh, and nice and whatnot. And uh, this is actually so effective that uh, they used it initially uh, to advertise, they would splice in images of people like drinking a Coke or whatever. So if you're watching this movie and all of a sudden you would crave a Coke and you wouldn't know why, it's because they were actually uh, altering your perception unknowingly. So then you're more likely to go up and, and, and to buy a Coke uh, after getting this thirst and this quench for it or popcorn or whatever it might be. All right, that's the balloon messaging. So don't, don't mix the two up. This is your ability to take in information consciously and unconsciously, even if it's so fast you don't really realize it. And this is the impact it has on your perception. Uh, so again, I get the uneasy feeling from seeing these, even though I don't know it, and I apply it to uh, the guy I'm looking at, I perceive him differently. Same with the puppy, but the reverse, uh, happy instead of untrustworthy. You guys got that? Sweet.